welcome members of ICAB and uh, non-members of ICAB, all of you who have joined us today. I want to welcome you to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados Week, Accountants Week 2021 to our panel discussion, our topic, accountability in a time of crisis. Today we have three distinguished panelists, I, that's indisputable, and um, we have with us today Justin Robinson, Professor Justin Robinson, Dr. Kevin Greenidge, Mr. Edward Clark. And just let me introduce these gentlemen to you properly and give you an idea as to why they are excellent participants in this panel discussion. Justin, I call him Justin, I'm sorry, Justin, <laughs> Professor Justin Robinson. I've known Justin for quite a long time. We were actually on campus together as uh, was Kevin. And um, Professor Robinson, is a national of St. Vincent, and I dare say of Barbados, and um, currently oversees the Office of the Board of, for Undergraduate Studies at the University of the West Indies. He is charged with responsibility for policy, quality, and regionality in developing and coordinating policy initiatives to guide all aspects of undergraduate and sub-degree program programming at the University of the West Indies and its regional and global affiliates. Professor Robinson obtained his PhD in finance from the University of Manchester in the UK. He also holds a Master of Science in Finance and Econometrics from the Florida International University and a Bachelor of Science in Management Studies uh, with first class honors from the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. His research interests are capital markets in developing countries, public finance, financial risk management on corporate finance. He also has published extensively on these subjects in several regional and international journals. Professor Robinson's portfolio of public service uh, to national, regional and international public and scholarly bodies spans positions such as the director of the Central Bank of Barbados, first vice president of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, chair of the Barbados National Insurance Scheme, and member of the Oversight Committee on State-Owned Enterprises in Barbados. Welcome, Justin. Thanks for joining us. We also have with us Dr. Kevin Greenwich, senior, senior economic advisor to the government of Barbados. Dr. Greenwich is the, as I've just said, senior advisor to the Barbados government on leave from the International Monetary Fund, where he is a senior economist since, and has been since 2011. Prior to that, he was director of the Research and Economic Analysis Department at the Central Bank of Barbados, where he spent 17 years. Dr. Greenwich holds a BSc in Economics with first class honors from the University of the West Indies, a master's in Economics from the University of Cambridge in the UK, and a PhD from the University of Nottingham, also in the UK. He also holds an associate degree in business management from Columbia University. Dr. Greenwich has published extensively in the area of economics. His publications include the measurement of financial liberalization and the challenges of policymakers in small developing countries, issues of exchange rate misalignment in the Caribbean, cross-country monetary effects and growth and convergence in the Caribbean. And his current research focuses on growth and debt dynamics in small island economies, the macroeconomic effects of governance and corruption and on fiscal multipliers and growth. Dr. Greenwich is also a member of the International Atlantic Economic Society, the Western Economic Association, and he's a fellow of the Cambridge Commonwealth Society. We have with us as well today on our esteemed panel, Mr. Edward Clark. John Edward Clark, can we call him Ed, <laughs> is a director of strategic projects for Sajikar Life Inc. in Barbados. He retired from his position as executive vice president and general manager of the Barbados operations for Sajikar Life, Sajikar Life, sorry, in June of 2020 after 13 years with Sajikar. Mr. Clark is a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and is a certified internal auditor with more than 45 years experience in the field of auditing, accounting, financial services and international business management. 
and he has held senior management positions at Texaco and Chevron Inc and served as a senior manager at Chevron um, in their finance team in Barbados, Nigeria and the USA. Ed is currently a director of Sajikor General Insurance Inc, Sajikor Funds Incorporated, Sajikor Asset Management Inc, the Estates Group Holdings Limited and uh, other local companies as well. He's the immediate past chairman of the Barbados Private Sector Association and the immediate past co-chair of the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Monitoring Committee. I'm Trisha Watson. I'll be your moderator for today as we have our conversation with our panel on the issue of comfortability at a time of crisis. Today we will, just a few house rules, we will be having our discussion of course but we also want you the audience to be interactive we will be taking your questions uh, both verbally and uh, via our chat methodology so you will write your questions and those questions will be put to the panel as they come in and we want you to give us the questions as we go along so that you know we're not waiting to the end and and missing your questions your questions are very important to us important for the panel to be able to address all right, let's get to the issue of accountability in a time of crisis. We all know that we are currently in a time that we can most definitely label as a crisis. And the topic of accountability and, and how national and private institutions deal with accountability at these times obviously is quite topical. And not just topical in this current crisis or any crisis that any of those entities might face and, and including entities, obviously, the government, even though it's not an entity per se, but we are looking at how national institutions, how companies will have to deal with the issue of accountability during this current crisis and any crisis that they may confront uh, as we move along in the future. And so let us look at what, you know, some, some international bodies have been looking at in relation to the issue of accountability. Now, the UN Human Rights Council uh, has pointed to three, point, three pillars of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, namely to protect, to respect, and to remedy. And they, in delineating those principles, those pillars, have as their first pillar the state's duty to protect human rights. And that obviously we all understand the principle of human rights is it's based on the fundamental obligation to protect rights holders. And uh, uh, this applies obviously in normal circumstances and in times of crisis. And the global pandemic and the economic crisis that has accompanied that pandemic inevitably has put us in a position where we have to consider how we deal with the crisis, how we respond quickly and sometimes forcefully, I might add, but at the same time maintain this pillar of seeing that the individual rights are maintained and at the same time, obviously, ensuring that management of a uh, crisis will be done effectively by the state. And um, the, the UN points out that there is a need to safeguard vulnerable workers, there's a need to safeguard consumers, and there's also a need to safeguard businesses because obviously we want that businesses continue to be operational and continue to be, to function effectively because their workers and families that rely on these businesses and not just workers and families, but other businesses that rely on these businesses. And, uh, their second pillar of guiding prints of this guiding principles would then relate to the business's responsibility to respect human rights uh, as they are embarking on their efforts to maintain their businesses to you know satisfy internal accountability requirements and to be profitable which is the ultimate objective of the business and uh, as the un says the crisis puts enormous strain on businesses across sectors and we are interested in looking at how businesses can maintain their internal accountability requirements and their accountability to their stakeholders whether it's consumers shareholders etc um, regulators at a time of crisis where you know 
things change and it is necessary for everybody to be agile and for some extraordinary um, activities to occur or efforts to be put in place to manage things. And then thirdly, we have the requirement as a third principle that there's a need for individuals and institutions to be able to access remedies, justice as it were, uh, whether that is um, formal through the courts or have some other opportunity to have any uh, abuse or misdeed or maladministration uh, addressed through some other form of remedy. And so having laid that groundwork, I want to go straight to the panel to ask the panel to comment for me on their thoughts on how government and national institutions and businesses can achieve internal accountability and demonstrate that accountability to their constituents in normal times. So you want to lay the groundwork and then consider how that differs at a time of crisis. Ed, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tricia. Uh, and, um, good evening, everyone, and it's, it's nice to be here. And um, congrats to ICAD for hosting this event. I think, Tricia, it's important that we understand the, the framework of accountability and what, 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 what really is accountability. You know, but it stems a lot from the culture, the culture within an organization or the culture within a government. And accountability isn't going to occur overnight if you don't have that accountability culture in an organization or a government, a government set to over a period of time. Um, prior to, to any event. Now, you have to have strong leadership. You have to have mechanisms that we can we can roll out to our people who are reporting to us, including share and for us who are reporting to shareholders, etc. You have to be opening your communication. We, we believe that you have to have a very strong governance model uh, in business and in, and in government. And, and certainly this is something we later see improve in, in the government sector. But certainly in the business sector, Many large organizations that operate here in Barbados have a pretty strong governance culture. Uh, is it something that we could probably do strengthening in some other organizations? But that, that comes with education and training of individuals as we go along. Uh, boards of directors training, ensure that the directors of, of the, our companies are, are, are responsible for what they do and are held accountable for their roles as directors. Similarly, the management team that reports to the directors. We are we have to be held accountable for our actions. We we carry out the, the policies of the companies we, we work for, but we are responsible to that board and we have to be held accountable by that board for any actions that we, we take. Um, so I think it has to stem from an underlying culture in an organization. You have to be open, you have to be fair, you have to be honest, and you have to be trust seen to be trustworthy by the people you are working with and the people you're reporting to and the clients that you're serving. If you don't have that on the core, that core on the lion culture, you have a problem in developing true accountability. And, and that is where people start to lose confidence then in how people are held accountable for their actions or a lack of actions. I will start there at this time and maybe one of the others can continue from there. You're mute, Tricia, I think. Sorry, I hope you, I've got it. I hope that you um, don't mind if I'm calling you by your first names. I've known each of oh. you, um, encountered you before, and known some of two of you for a very long time. We won't say how long, <laughs> but um, Kevin, obviously, as in in your role as an advisor to the government, you are dealing and specifically in relation to the program that we're in now, the BERT program, you're dealing with accountability at different levels. And so I'd like you to comment for us first on the issue of accountability in, let's say, normal times when, you know, there's equilibrium to the extent that there would be. And uh, then we, we can talk after we've spoken after we've spoken with Justin on the issue of how that changes at a time of crisis like the crisis that we're facing now please go ahead Kevin Kevin I think your mic is off hey not, not a good start is this better now yes good. 
Yeah, let me perhaps begin by speaking a bit about what I, you know, my concept of accountability at the simplest level. Um, then perhaps talk a bit more from the government side. Um, and this concept of accountability sometimes, in my view, is quite elusive. But at a simple sense, it is about ansibility, if there's such a word. And this refers to the obligation to want to give account of the actions to individuals, groups, organizations. So for me, at the corporation or the business level, is when a business takes responsibility for the actions and the actions of those actions. Uh, when the corporations, for example, commits to take accountability to ensure that they are all so going to take responsibility for when things going wrong, as well as such as when things go right. It means, as I mentioned, having procedures in place, training employees well enough so that they know exactly what's expected from them, implementing systems where they can data can be stored securely, safely, and retrievable and made available in terms of transparency. And also when problems arise, ensuring that individuals and the employees are held to account. At the level of government, it's really about enabling people to know how the government, in my view, this is a simple view, how the government is doing, how to gain redress, redress when things aren't going quite well, how to ensure ministers and civil servants act in the interest of the people that they are serving. In fact, accountability from this part of the whole governance procedure and is used to increase trustworthiness and legitimacy in terms of what governments are doing. Um, and there's benefits of having strong accountability. So we're not only talking about being answerable, but at the heart of accountability is about the relationship between those responsible for something who've been charged of doing something and those who have a role in passing judgment, how well that something or responsibility is being discharged. Um, when it works well, it enables a, the high degree of feedback between the government and the public that is serving in the private sector, between the managers and the stakeholders, for, for example. Now, and, and so for me, that's the simplest view of looking at it in terms of comfortability. As you mentioned, I've been on the BERT program, I advised the government from the start. And I must tell you that accountability has been one of the pillars of the work program and transparency, improving that as, um, as we embark on transforming this economy. Um, before, I mean, you, we will eventually get into how things have changed, uh, pandemic post, but not post pandemic, during the pandemic. But you recall from the start of the program, one of the first things that happened was the new financial management act. And that financial management act was revised to include standardized procedures for mon monitoring, monitoring, reporting on government fiscal objectives. That financial management act have a number of parts that we have been implementing over time. We can speak to those a bit later. But for example, it requires a detailed fiscal framework to be developed and reported to in cabinet. And that fiscal framework, looking at government overall objectives now and into the future, and then reports intermediately on how government is achieving that, so that citizens and persons can see what how things are being done, how they are being um, accounted for. Um, that PFM Act speaks about strengthening accountability in respect to the control of expenditures. For example, when officers, accounting officers in the various ministries are required now to submit spending, procurement, and cash plans to the Ministry of Finance. Public officers, for example, are prohibited from increasing, ain't doing anything to increase government liability at respect without specific authorization. These things weren't spoken about before the Public Financial Management Act came into place. Um, financial and non-financial performance reports are expected by every ministry to be included in the estimates weren't done before and submitted prior to the, to the estimates being done. And so that, I think, was a huge step and increased the level of accountability and transparency. And I can talk about how we have, what has been being, being done with that. For example, um, under the Financial Management Act, over the time, even, and things have continued through COVID, even though they are slowed, or under that act, it looks to increase, government has put a number of measures to increase our accountability and transparency in the state own enterprises. You have known that one of the issues or the diagnosed ills of the program 
was that the SOEs have ballooned so much in size and structures. They were not reporting. Some have been reporting for 15, 10, 15 years. No one knew what they were doing properly. They were ballooned. They were drained on the fiscal. And the whole part of the book program was to fix those. You remember from time we had the online survey. I had a reform program. We've done a lot in that. And so there were a number of reforms to strengthen oversight and limit the fiscal risk that came on from the SOEs. Um, on the, uh, the finance app, for example, and so no time written approval of interest finance in order so we can control our borrowing and know what our debt is. And the app also allows for sanctions against SOEs and non-compliance in terms of the reporting requirements that report that are required to report by the fifth of the month on their payables, their 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 uh, any their income and flow statements, things like that. Um, and the legislation also requires, and we have started to do that, that government and parliament to receive regular financial reports on these SOE's performance. And the management of accounting using has been strengthened. There's a mission finance. I have oversight authority now over all SOEs, and they are required to monitor on the day to go basis. I can continue with some of the reforms, but um, I'm right, there for now. I'm, I'm going to jump in here. That's some very useful information and it will fuel some additional discussion as we go along. I'm going to jump to Justin now. Justin, similarly, can you comment on the issue of accountability? You obviously are in a different sector, but and you would have your own uh, accountability requirements and uh, uh, your, your own measurement standards, but of course, you do do some business activities as well as an institution and as you you've indicated as i've indicated uh, you've in your role national and regional role you've been a director of of some national institutions and so could you comment for the audience on the issue of accountability what we should be looking for um, from accountability from government government institutions, government itself, central government, or an institution such as yours, um, at times of, we'll use the term normalcy for the time being, um, before we move on to really look at how the a crisis, whether it's the one that we're in now or any other crisis could affect that, and how we address the issue of maintaining a level of accountability at times of crisis. Okay, thanks, Tricia, and good evening to everyone. Always a pleasure being at ICAP, many contemporaries, many former students as well. So when I think of accountability, I, I, I sort of depart from the notion that you have, a, you have expectations and you have standards. You know, there, there's some expectation, there's some standard. And accountability, you, you're really trying to measure the extent to which those expectations and standards are being met. So in terms of an organization context, you know, there, there are a range of mechanisms that, that are deployed in establishing those standards, expectations, and measures for are they being met. So when I think of a corporate setting, in many ways, the, the ultimate accountability device is your strategic plan. <laughs> you know, you, you lay out in your strategic plan, this is what we this is what this is who we are, what we set out to do. You define a number of what we call them key performance indicators, KPIs. These are targets that are supposed to be met. And then these are really diffused throughout the organization. So let's say at UWI, we see what's happening with the BIRD program and the economy, and we recognize that we need to reduce our dependence on, say, government funding. So in our strategic plan, one of our key performance indicators would be by 2022 to have 25% of our financing come from non-governmental sources. So, so that's a clear standard, a clear expectation, which then diffuses through the organization. Each faculty, each department would then lay out its plans, etc., for meeting in terms of what is their contribution. And I think that's an extremely important part of accountability because what you don't want to have in organizations, you know, is that the operation was successful, but the patient is dead. 
<laughs> you, you actually don't really want that. So if our talk, so it's one thing to say we have all of these policies, we have all of these procedures, we have all of these action plans, but exactly what are you driving towards? How do we know you have succeeded? So, 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 so I think of accountability as really operating, operating those expectations, those key performance indicators, those standards. So, you know, when we grant a UWI degree, what are these standards that a graduate is supposed to meet? So when you hire an accountant or an accounting or a law graduate, what are the skills, competencies they're supposed to have? And then we build back to our systems. How do we assess those? Now, looking, segueing in and looking ahead to the second part of your question, what I think happens in a crisis is whether you need now to review what are some of my, are some of my expectations and standards still relevant and realistic in this crisis environment and the mechanisms or the strategies to achieve my targets are really, are they still relevant? So, so, so I think the accountability framework of holding your organizations, your staff, your units, the government to certain standards and expectations. I think that still holds, but exactly what is that standard? What are the acceptable strategies for achieving there? And, and, and we've never seen a crisis like COVID. I mean, I don't envy the government and, and the advisors who are dealing with this on the ground. And certainly in my own area, you know, we, we've been doing this for a long time, people come up to the campus, we teach them, we bring them into a room and we lock them away for three out two hours and we give them an exam. And then suddenly you have a state of emergency, you can't bring anybody on campus to teach them, you can't examine those ways. But the standards are still there, people still expect us to provide our educational goods and services. So then there's a real challenge, how do you pivot and deliver that in a manner that really meets those expected performance standards. I think I'll stop there in terms of my opening speech. So let, let's talk about how we pivot, how we do things differently. So I think all of us would have had to experience that. I had a very interesting experience of having to go to court, which I don't do if I can avoid my if I can <laughs> avoid it, <laughs> but having to don my gown and sit in front of my computer and be in court. And it was surreal on different levels. But the functioning had to occur because that obviously is a key institution for ensuring that there is, well, governance at the highest levels, but that we have a level of stability, whatever is going on in the country and the economy. And so we've seen institutions have to absolutely pivot, pivot and absolutely have to front load things that they may not have been looking to have on their agenda immediately. So let's talk about how that affects companies or how it can um, and other institutions and and we most definitely will have to touch on the issue of how it affects the government how the government function because we're all relying on the government to manage in this crisis but all crises aren't national there are obviously institutional crises that you will have to deal with and so ed can you talk to us a bit about how um in a, as a corporation you mm -hmm. would expect the corporation to function i think one of the things we've had to address for example is having meetings so annual general meetings board meetings etc and while we may have been doing some of that uh, remotely because we may have remote directors certainly the agm and and where it's a uh, financial services entity so regulated and having mm -hmm. to have meetings on a, a particular basis tell us about the practical things that you've had to confront and your recommendations for how a company would address these things that kind of land on their laps <laughs> mm -hmm. just like that and not just your internal changes but also how you address those changes with your stakeholders right right well, let me let me start from within, and then I go out to the to the stakeholders. Um, I think I think it's important that you have a, a a policy of business continuity. You have a policy of crisis management, emergency uh, procedures in place under your governance structure. Um, certainly, I was fortunate to work with a company that we were very strong on that, and I think business continuity management 
is uh, there's a gap of that in the region, not just Barbados, but regionally. And it certainly came to the fore during COVID, the onslaught of COVID. Um, at Sajikor, I can call Sajikor's name. We were very, we were very prepared for emergency management, for crisis management, and business continuity, in the sense that when we were told you have to shut your doors, um, although we were not prepared for that short notice, within a matter of 48 to 72 hours, we had every single employee that we needed with a computer working at their home be able to work online um, and that was a that that didn't come about without a tremendous amount of prior planning and business continuity um, crisis management we, we, we have to have that you have to have that structure around you you have to have rehearsals procedures practices uh, how to handle these emergency situations but the emergency is one thing but managing the business continuity is where many companies in Barbados and the region have fallen down, and globally have fallen down. I am, I'm happy to say that, that we were able to get through it because we were pretty well prepared for it. Um, not 100% not far from, but we were certainly very well, much better prepared than many other people. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we found too is that at a time of crisis, a lot of people tend to take shortcuts. People tend to panic. When people panic, they make bad decisions. People looking in from the outside take that opportunity to create further panic and chaos so that they can take advantage of your situation. We have seen that in Barbados. We've seen that in businesses where people try to commit fraud against companies, um, spear phishing and all these different tactics that they've used to get people because there is a lot less physical interaction, a lot more virtual interaction uh, using technology. So people are now so reliant on that, that unless you are very well controlled and managed, you are open to these attacks from various people. So you have to have the procedures, the controls in place to manage your business much better in a crisis. And, and that's why I say you have, you have to be even more prepared in a crisis because you are the target of many other people coming at you. Um, so those are things that I think you need to be prepared for. Use of technology is a tremendous asset for us. We had to apply the use of technology. Many good businesses in Barbados use technology to their advantage. Many small businesses in Barbados, a lot of the guys, remember when we couldn't get food in the supermarkets? when people started to home deliver, when first time we had uh, delivery of, of all of these restaurant meals and so on, uh, curbside delivery, a lot of things people had to change. Now, a lot of them were unprepared, but they got up to speed pretty quickly, uh, especially the smaller businesses that they have to go through all of the bureaucracy and, the, and, and, and you know, they, they made their own decisions, um, but they got up to speed pretty quickly, a lot of the smaller ones. These are the, the use of technology is a tremendous asset at this time in Barbados and, and globally. And the businesses that have been able to use it to the best of their uh, ability are the ones that have taken advantage of the situation and, and, and have progressed pretty rapidly. Um, I, I don't think I think in a time of crisis, you, you still have to have full accountability. I don't see any change in that. Um, the procedures, the approval levels, the delegation of authorities, these things don't go away. As I said, you have to ensure you have strong delegations, strong controls and strong um, systems in place. Our technology systems um, have to be really strong. You have to have very good IT controls, very good security, cyber security, and especially at these times because people try to take advantage of the side of your situations. But the core has to be there. You have to be prepared. You have to plan. You know, as Justin said, your strategic plan may have gone through the window to some degree, but the core concept is the same. You still have your CSR, you still have your corporate social responsibility, you still have your employees responsibility, your human resource capital management. You still have to get your returns to back to your investors. You have to manage your cash and your investment portfolio. Nothing changes, but you have to change the way you do business. And the faster that you can adapt within a managed environment, the more successful you will be. You, you can't ignore it. 
So before I go to Kevin, let me ask you a question about the issue of accountability to external parties. So you have accountability to your regulators, you have your sure. accountability sure. to your... But I actually have my, my mic on, if you can't hear me. Is everybody hearing me all right? Just wave and let me know. All right. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. So yes, as Ed, as I was saying, you you spoke a lot about the internal activity and obviously being prepared, planning. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a bit about accountability to stakeholders. So accountability to regulators, I'm going to use that term to mm -hmm. essentially mean government and the regulatory entities. And because you have obviously different compliance requirements and different entities that you have to interface with and accountability to your customers. Yeah. So, well, um, uh, okay, I'll let you comment. Go let ahead. me start with the, with the regulators. I think you, you have to have a, a good relationship with the regulators, any of pre, pre, pre crisis or not, um, but you have to stay in constant contact, let them know what you're doing. And, and that is something that you have to have open communication with your regulator because the way you do business is changing and ha ha has had to change as a result. And so, you, and virtually working with government, setting up protocols, things like that. A lot of that had to take place. So you had to be in constant contact, have to be in constant contact and be very open in what you're capable of doing and what you're not capable of doing. This is time for honesty, open and frankness in your communication with the regulator. And I think that that, that is critical. When it comes to your shareholders, like for example, as you said, yes, we couldn't have any AGMs anymore in person because of the controls of the, the protocol or the protocols. Um, we we were fortunate that because we were based in Bermuda, we were allowed to have online AGMs at the time. In Barbados now, you can have the the, the virtual AGMs. Um, we have had one recently, one of our other companies recently, but that certainly was a change that was brought about by a need. And much needed change, as a matter of fact, we are very happy to see that. And we hope we see more and more of these virtual um, um, changes happening. But you have to be still accountable to your to your shareholders. You got to be accountable to your customers. Um, you, you, you know, some of our service levels, maybe at stages, were not where we wanted it to be. And many companies had that complaint. As you know, you'll know some of the retail outlets had that complaint. The restaurants and service providers had that complaints. But it, is, it was a learning experience for a lot of people. I think as as the, as the crisis um, progressed, people got a lot better at what they were doing because they were more accustomed to doing it and ironed out all the kinks in what they were trying to do. Um, but you, to be open and frank, we are capable of doing this, we're not capable of doing that. I think you have to keep open and frank communications with your employees as well. Your employees are critical at a time of crisis. You have to remain confident you have to portray a sense of confidence when you're dealing with your employees. Certainly do not panic. Panic is one of the worst things to happen. And when you're a leader, you can't panic. You have to show a face of confidence, portray that confidence to your team, to your customers, and to the wider, wider um, base, you know, your, your stakeholders. So confidence and leadership, a lot to do with leadership. And it goes back to accountability. You know, you have to be able to portray that confidence and your people as well, uh, in, in, and, and your board of directors and your stakeholders have to have confidence in you as a leader that you're capable of managing the situation on the crisis. Thanks, Ed. Kevin, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, government and governance and accountability. Now, many commentators you know, across the globe have looked at the issue of suspension of norms and practices that came about as a result of this current crisis. And uh, certainly I recall very early um, having a communique from the Commonwealth Lawyers Association uh, pointing to the way that governments should go about dealing with their crisis management and in particular adherence to the rule of law, ensuring that, you know, fairness, procedural fairness, et cetera, et cetera, all of that continue to obtain. And uh, there is a, a concern that being agile, being swift, being decisive can sometimes trump what we would regard as the operation of the rule of law. And certainly in Barbados, our own protocols have established uh, a process that 
does not involve uh, the legislature in setting some rules insofar as they, they relate to emergency management. And of course, we're looking broadly at the issue of crisis management. And so when we talk about crisis management, we are talking about the issue of uh, emergency management, regardless of whether it is COVID or any other emergency that we would might be confronted with. And so we've had queries related to rights, queries related to constitutionality, queries related to legality of actions that are taken. And every single government institution obviously has has to operate within this context. So you referred earlier to the SOE, you have the government programs that they have to continue to comply with. And so I want you to comment for us on that issue of central government's responsibility, accountability to the people. And in that regard, I will specifically raise issues related to, for example, that there's a call for a budget to be presented, which we haven't seen, um, certainly in the last year. And I think in November, we would think that it would be due at this time. Uh, issues related to the, the freedom of information and uh, um, integrity in public life, legislation that we expected we would have in place at this time. Now, I'm not asking you to make political comments, but they, they all go to the issue of accountability and um, transparency, etc. So I would like you to talk to the audience about how government ought to proceed to deal with those kinds of issues vis-a-vis -vis how our government has had to handle dealing with the crisis, but also meeting the expectations of the people um, to keep the norms, for example, the budget process, etc., or to, comp to, to deliver what the government has said they would deliver in terms of accountability and transparency. Yes, Chris. <clears throat> that was a long question, so you may have to remind me if I miss some parts of it. Please. I will, I will. Um, so you start, you start out by saying, and you're quite correct, that the crisis, not only as government barbers, but all governments, that the crisis required urgent action. And in many cases, it became difficult for some kind of calling question balancing accountability, integrity, and transparency. And in fact, I would tell you, they should suggest that pandemics and the history of pandemics and disasters all these systems, control systems, tend to be suspended, bypassed, weakened, whatever. But what I can say, and I will give you examples and speak to those, is that I firmly believe that we've actually increased accountability and transparency during the crisis in an effort to remain, well, an effort to remain transparent and to bring people along with what needed to be done. Um, our Prime Minister has said from the beginning, and that's the economic team and the ministries to ensure that things are done always in a transparent manner. So let me explain, for example, we have during the crisis, the government put a system in place to track all related COVID expenditures. So much so, and, and, and not only track them, there's a budget line in the national uh, financial, uh, government financial statistics, a budget line that captures all related. So when a ministry needs to spend or spend something on COVID, there's a line in the code which you use as they request a supplementary or assistance. And that is able to tally up so that we had the IMF meeting last week, uh, review mission, <clears throat> and we were able to show them detail point by point what we spent on COVID related expenditures last year, fiscal year um, 2021, and already for fiscal year 21, 22. What was the cost of asphalt cleanup? What was the cost of Hurricane Elsa? Before we didn't have that in our accounts. But at the beginning, there was the PM, Prime Minister felt that this was something that, and always felt that this thing would be well so well, so we need to be able to track it. And today we had concluded a discussion with Standards and Ports, um, with the agencies, and again, this information was needed. So we saw the importance of being able to track this. In addition, in the heart of the COVID, uh, response. The government put in place measures where government had to report to Parliament on all COVID-related procurement contracts in excess of one million, so that Parliament had to give approval on these on many of these, and we can't know what those procurements were. 
Um, and that increased accountability and transparency that's available for anyone to see. Go on Parliament website, you can see what these are. Um, we have also bringing to the, um, by the end of this year, the procurement bill, a, review, a renewed procurement bill. We haven't had one before. We've been using pieces of legislation, a new procurement bill, and that has been worked through even through the pandemic. That new procurement bill will see a number of um, law, the procurement law will see a strengthening of the procurement system to ensure fairness, integrity, and transparency of the procurement process. Um, we expect to have that by the end of this year. And the law will provide a framework also, the procurement law provides a framework to facilitate the audit of those crisis related expenditures that took place during the COVID period, now and be, then now and beyond. So that gives the legal framework for the audit general to do, and they've already, I believe, embarked on that in order to ensure that we, that the government remain accountable to people for how they spent the money. Um, another important part of procurement laws, which is now the hallmark in terms of international standards, is for the publication of all contracts and such names of successful bidder, bidders. And that is also facilitated in a new procurement bill. In addition to that, we have at Kaipo, the corporate registry, we have built a um, beneficial ownership database whereby persons can now go and look at successful bidders and see beneficial ownership data on, on that. This is the latest in terms of accountability and transparency. So when I say that in my humble view, we've actually become more transparent and effort purposefully so during the, um, the, the, the COVID, um, this in response to COVID, et cetera. You talk about fiscal policy, you talk about budgeting. Um, I am still at a loss why persons will be asking for a budget to come when you've had so many ministerial um, budget speeches by Prime Minister, the numbers are there. Let me, let, me, let me speak to that for a minute. We have actually introduced during the COVID, a start, and we haven't finished it, started during the COVID period the introduction of fiscal rule. By the end of this year, we expect to adopt regulations for a procedural fiscal rule, which guides fiscal policy. Uh, that <clears throat> will require government to publish, and uh, prepare and publish annually a fiscal strategy, not just a budget of numbers, but a strategy, a mighty year strategy of its plans going forward. And as the immediate and how we, how we, how we um, implement that strategy, I mean, any citizen, anyone can see that strategy and measure against what you say you will do. I think it was what uh, Professor Robinson Justin was saying just now about standards and what how you have accomplished for that and what you have done. And as an intern step, the government already tabled in Parliament in August this year a base a, a fiscal framework for the fiscal year 22-23 income year containing all the medium term projections, discussion of fiscal policy objectives, how we're going to reach that anchor by the Pacific time. That was tabled in August. And then a mid-year report was tabled, was sent to Parliament on the 15th of October on what we have done so far to reach that. Now, if that any transparency, improving account and accountability, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what, what is. That proposed um, fiscal rule, allows government now and it's definitely marked by the within agencies they took note of that the mf took note of that and is flagging the, the, the um conclusive amf report we flag it to the smp that has increased accountability in fiscal policy making and allow government still because of the flexible procedural rule to respond to pandemic natural disasters is like once that fiscal procedure rule goes to Parliament, we will even give the considerations being given to convert it into a numerical rule where you actually have the numbers. But our work program already built in with numerical rules. You know that path is 6% by 2035. You know you must run a certain primary path in order to achieve that. Anybody could go and test it. We publish all this information. And so, again, just to support the point that these things have happened, there's no question of the direction of government fiscal policy during the pandemic. We were told at the beginning we were targeting a primary surplus of 
uh, six percent has always appeared on debt. In fiscal year 1920 to March 2020, we hit six. We were planning to do it again, but because you lost six hundred million dollars in revenues, and they had to step up expenditures, which I just noted, we're keeping a careful track of. You can see, and you look at the various publications, MF, etc., that we relaxed the fiscal position to eventually for the year that the COVID year. 2021, we ran a negative uh, uh, deficit of minus 1%. Um, and that, 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 that is out there very important. Um, you're, 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 you're going to stop me on something? Continue, Kevin. No, I was saying, it, so I, I'm trying, I'm tackling the question you asked me about budget and policy. Um, the fiscal rules initiative, in, uh, part and parcel, is the implementation of reforms under the 2019 PF Financial Management Act at repass, as I said earlier, designed to bring greater accountability, transparency, and efficiency in government financials by providing the standardized procedures and managing the, 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 the reporting on the fiscal objective of government. Now, the preparation of, of a fiscal framework, the one that I mentioned, we just put in the parliament, is actually a, 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 an important advance in strategic budget formulation, not just presenting a budget. It, it, it expected that would inform a multi-year, and I would tell you this is already pretty important in business, not a single year budget, a multi-year expansion ceiling approach in line with government or fiscal objective. Um, that multi-year budget report we would expect to be laid in Parliament on the 15th of October every month, according to the, uh, every year, according to the, um, the, the PFM uh, and we'll report on progress vis-a-vis -vis the framework that we have already put there. Okay, well, um, if I can there's someone... here. Yes, right. go ahead. I think, I think what, what people will ask is all that being put in place, can we expect that when these measures and these these controls are put in place at times of crisis where there may be a tendency to set things aside, whether Barbadian, what it might, whether it might be taxpayers, voters, citizens, residents, what have you, can expect? Can, can we expect that we are com that there's compliance now, where measures are already in place, and that compliance would not be set aside? The compliance that obviously goes hand in hand with ensuring that government entities are accountable. Um, and, and, and we do have a question here, for example, that says, have all entities complied with the requirements? And I think that is a question related to the legislation, Financial Management Act. And uh, for those who have not complied, what action was taken to hold them accountable? So we're still coming back to the issue of accountability um, and ensuring that the the measures for accountability are met even in times of crisis. So can you comment about whether we are where we are with that and how we can be how we can feel certain that we will have those measures complied with whatever the circumstances may be, whether well, normalcy so, okay. or crisis. As I said earlier, I believe we have increased uh, measures, put measures in place to strengthen accountability and transparency, even during the crisis. In my view, if we if we had to come this path again, we'd be better prepared because the systems are there. In fact, after we come out of COVID, because you have built systems, PFM will be there. The procedures reporting on expenditures will be there. The the over the, the, the overarching procurement new build will be there in terms of contracts and build. all these things are building. You have to build systems not for people or for, for any government, but for the overall uh, contribution of the public sector. Now you're asking about complex. Prior to all of this, the SOEs, you have about 90 or 100 of them, we've reduced, we've done fix and start work on that. You know the work we start. That work was put aside because of COVID. We have to get back to that reform agenda to continue to try to strengthen and make these institutions fit for purpose. But prior to that, they weren't even reporting. Now all of them report on the fifth of the month. Now you're right, we have a few slackers sometimes because of different things and I mean this problem is a work in progress so because maybe a financial officer is on leave or maybe because they are tight on expenditure and sometimes you may, out of all, you may have five or so that haven't reported on time right and the director of finance myself and others 
to call a meeting, bring those persons together and continue to understand. Because you have to help people as something to adjust. Coming from not reporting for 10 years or not reporting at all to having reports on the fifth of the month is a hard task, right? But that report goes to Parliament, the uh, 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 Parliament is aware of it. But then we speak to these persons, we speak to the accounting uh, officers, and we go, what's the problem? Why are you unable to report? Well, the system was down. Why was it down? Well, because you're waiting on this. Okay, let's get this fixed. So sometimes it means it's not a chastising. It's working with people, working with the FO, the financial officers, et cetera, to ensure that they can report on time. Over expansion, sometimes something comes down, and you have to look and say, but I'm not sure if this is COVID related. What is it? Need more explanation. Persons in the ministry of um, uh, account unit, we get on the phone and etc. The, the, the officers call the SOE. What's going on here? What is it? We need more data, etc. Because and that's all part of us uh, getting person accustomed to reporting in a particular manner that we can monitor consistently. So it won't take time. But we are in a better position than we were prior to COVID. We work through COVID and put systems in place. And the answer to the question, those systems will stand us better going forward. And even the absence of a, a pandemic will, has strengthened our public policy and accountability and transparency. All right, thank you. So let me ask this question. I'm going to throw this question to you, Justin. Uh, Kevin, you may have to jump in as well. But so these systems are in place. I'm familiar. Uh, to some extent with the Public Finance Management Act because I've had to deal with it professionally and giving advice. But, and I, I think, it, well, some, some people might not be aware, but I, I think it was fairly well publicized that that was being put into place. But after the internal measures have been taken, reporting, etc., Barbadians will say, how are you accountable to us? So we come back to what's happening at the level of the legislature and uh, the kind of reporting that goes in there. And I, I have to be complimentary to the government because we have Parliament TV, we have access, and we have that with a level on co of consistency that is commendable. Um, but I think we will say, where can we find information easily? My own experiences uh, interfacing with uh, government entities, particularly during the current crisis, because we've had, we've been driven uh, to online activity all the more so. We are not where we should be, both from a, an information availability perspective and an access perspective. So from a technical perspective, does a ministry have a website? Is information there? Is it up to date? Justin, could you, as a, a, a person who has that same kind of responsibility, I think, in your institution, um, being, being responsible for um, dealing with your, your constituents, let's call them that, and um, having sat at a very high level in government entities and, and having to provide information. Can you comment for us on where you think we are and what you think we have to do as a country to get to the point where we feel that we have access to information um, fairly freely, not necessarily having to rely on a, on a press conference or anything that comes into the media, but we can get directly to access the information, including the kind of information that Kevin referred to, for example, the information we can expect related to procurement and so on. Okay, so come in again. I, 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 and before I comment, I just wanted to bounce off a couple of points from fellow panelists. I think Ed's point about the crisis planning is important because that's something we are, we are seeing a lot in the management literature that you know, many organizations have very surface level crisis plans. You know, you have a little fire drill, which nobody takes seriously. But but, but there isn't really a lot of in-depth planning for serious events. And, and that was a real gap that many organizations face. And maybe post-COVID, we will see more organizations really think about deep crises, you know, quite severe disruptions and I mean I, I know at UE you know you do your fire we had our fire drills if there's a tropical storm warning you cover up your computers and you plug out everything but but really not a lot of planning for a, an in-depth crisis in terms of the accountability I mean at any points Kevin were making also very important points but I think 
what we tend to see happen in the Caribbean historically and other parts of the world is that while you are while countries are in the IMF program and they have to report to the IMF, there's a high level of accountability. Everybody is meeting their benchmarks because you need that to get the drawdowns. But then the program ends and you kind of go back to normal and you almost go back. So, so I think what is really complementary about the modern IMF programs, and I think Kevin and his team are leading a very sophisticated modern IMF program, is that a lot of this accountability is being built into governance structures. You know, you have the fiscal rules, things, legislation, so that you really don't see what has happened historically. There is almost a revolving door into IMF programs because the program ends, you exit, you go back to your bad ways, and you end back in. So and, and back in the program. So I, I think what Kevin is points to making is quite important, and these are features of the modern IMF programs where you are most trying to legislate or have a structured framework for keeping people on the straight and narrow after the, after the program ends. I think one of the real challenges in our culture, and particularly in government, parastatal, things like UE, is is the whole culture around consequences. <laughs> yeah. and, and maybe consequences both positive and negative because in terms of enforcing accountability, you know, you have these benchmarks, you have these standards, but you know, we are human beings, you know, we, we, we respond behaviorally to, so, so you have people who are just gonna do what they have to do, but the majority of us, you know, we kind of need some sort of reward over there, some threat hanging. And I think where accountability tends to fall down, even when you are outside of an IMF program, even when you have a lot of these good legislation and benchmarks that Kevin is speaking of. I mean, I think even in my own organization, you, you know, we have a really fancy strategic plan laid out, all the KPIs, I mean, the guys went to town and so on. But, but what's the culture around consequences? When you don't meet your benchmark and so on, and I guess we kind of use the term locally here that we have a kind of career culture and, and so on. So I think that's one of the real issues that we need to address in terms of accountability, but also on the positive side. The, the information side is also, I, I find it really a fascinating one at the level of how we I don't want to overuse the word culture. So I always hear people say that they can't find this thing up for you. They're looking for this. And I'm like, but it's there on the website. And one of the discussions we have been having is, you know, we do our websites almost as if they are for us inside. You know, they're, they're very understandable to us yeah. inside of the organization. And how do we have a mental shift to presenting the information in a manner that is very accessible to external stakeholders because so what so some so sometimes people call me up and ask me but justin the government's been borrowing a lot of money how much money have they borrowed where can i get that information and i'm like wait but you know that is all at the back of the estimates document they, they, they really sure you like it's not people to read the estimates document i don't but i don't i don't know anybody else so in that. a sense we still run you know you can't the Barbados government can't hide and borrow money. You know, there's almost going to be some document in the public space. But I think our institutions and as players, we really have to work on that mind shift that, that we present this information and have it in places that external players who are not as steeped in the information can access. And I see it's a real gap. I, I am not persuaded where there's a desire to hide stuff. I think because I know the central bank, we work really hard at something we discuss. You know, how can we put this information out there that everybody can get it? I mean, Dr. Warrell started a lot of it, changing the pre the format of the presentation, trying to use more video, make it more accessible, more charts, and so on. So I I, I think it's I think the intent is there and, and it is a work in progress, but I do agree that we are not where we need to be in presenting that information. And I, I want to disagree with you slightly, Trisha, because I think 
one of the gaps with that information flow in our countries, I, I, I really put point a finger a bit at the press and the journalists because that they are the filters and I think they can do a lot more in investing in building up their economics and business desk because they really see things through the eyes of the public in a way that maybe some of us inside the organization with the best efforts can. But the press reports a lot on economic financial business data. And I'm not sure they have invested enough in building up a quality, building up the quality of business and economics data. They can really take this information and filter it out and translate it in ways. So I really see a major gap there. And I think our major newspapers broadcast, I think they could invest a lot more in building up their business and finance desk. Thank you. Uh, Tricia. Ed, Tricia, can, yeah. I, can I add to Yes, Ed, could you, you I see you, you uh, are indicating that you want to come in, so please do. Oh, I thought it was me. Thanks. Um, I wanted, you know, something, Kevin, uh, we, this reporting of SOEs, you know, but we have had Auditor General reports over the years, no consequences. Um, we have seen numerous reports come out from the Auditor General's office. Um, it all stems, in my opinion, from the lack of, of accountability, the, the lack of knowledge and awareness of those people who are on the boards of those SOEs to start with. How, if that was a public company, how could that board not be held accountable for those actions? It would not be tolerated by the shareholders. We are the shareholders of these people and these SOEs. And but but they don't report to us. They report to higher up. There are no consequences for the board not acting, and there are no consequences for the management of those SOEs not acting. And we have seen that over the years. I know now. I've seen some things starting to happen. But though that what has happened in Barbados in the last 15 to 20 years with those SOEs is a disgrace, where we haven't had audited statements published. And it goes right through up to the NIS at, 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 where it was very late. Many, many of these organizations have not been held accountable. In the private or in the public entities, business entities, uh, in, in public companies, that would never be tolerated, would not be accepted. And, and people have to be held accountable. The shareholders will hold the directors accountable. The directors will hold the management accountable unless there are consequences for lack of action and, and, and for your for you not being accountable. I mean, that is what it is. These people have not been accountable for their lack of action or their carelessness or, or whatever. And, and we have allowed that to happen in Barbados for way too long. Um, that is why I think the, in a corporate sense, there's much more, much more accountability in that regard. You have the AGMs. You have all the various quarterly reportings for the published published statements. Um, there, there are ways that we can ch the shareholders can challenge the board of directors. Unfortunately, in many cases, they are not very well attended, but there is an opportunity there for that. There is a whistleblower uh, thing for people for internally as well. We need to see that legislation come about in the in the in the, in the public service as well. But it, what has happened in the past cannot continue in Barbados. We, we are way past that as a country, and we have got to act professionally. We have to ensure, and I think ICAP has started uh, working with some of these SOEs and the boards of these SOEs, and I, I want to see that continue because the, the strength comes with the strength of the board of directors of these SOEs, and then the ministers they report to. But they have to be held accountable, and unless those boards are held accountable, they are not going to be hold, holding the people under them accountable. And, and, and that the strength of these boards is another matter. The, the days of being a political appointee to a board need to disappear. We, the people, need to have better representation on the boards of SOEs in Barbados. And I, I, I've seen some of that happening, but I would like to see a lot more of that happening going forward. That's my two cents at this time. Thanks, Ed. Ke Kevin, I, I know you want to jump in here. I'm going to anticipate some of what you're going to say and just let you uh, also address this question because I suspect this question not only does it 
relate to what Ed has raised, but it may well relate to what you might be um, looking to jump in to say, and that is, the question is, what are some of the sanctions being referred to for SOEs that are not reporting on time? And uh, I do know that the new Finance Management Act refers to training, it refers to responsibilities of um, SOE, directors of SOEs, both collectively and individually, and it does have some explicit terms in there relating to non-performance and their performance requirements. So can you answer uh, that question from a member of the audience relating to sanctions in addition to uh, what you wanted to say coming out of Justin's and Ed's comments? All right. Um, <clears throat> so let, let me begin really by, by Ed and then Justin and then move on a bit. Um, Ed, as you rightfully pointed out, our issues with SOEs didn't occur yesterday. It took years of building up where we had some SOEs that weren't reporting in 10 or 15 years. We have reached a position now. Yes, you can see that the glass is not quite full, but it certainly is not half empty anymore. All SOEs report by the fifth of the month. One and two, and they're not the same as all the time, may have issues either with the system down, COVID in the office, something, but all report. So we can keep track of their payables, their, their arrears, everything. And then once a quarter, all FOAs report, and that report has to go to the, 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 the parliamentary cabinet for discussion. We have developed with the assistance of the IMF Charter Office, uh, the assistance of the IMF Office, sorry, the local office here in Barbados, a dashboard, financial dashboard that assess various risks, financial, all types of risks within each SOE. And that financial dashboard, which is a high, high um, monitoring tool, goes also as part of the report to cabinet. And from that, we're able to assess the performance of, 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 of SOEs. Um, before I talk about complex, so that, so Ed, my point is we are so far, we've come so far, we're not quite where we want to be, where we how all SOEs efficient. It takes restructuring, it takes reforming a lot, doing with going in. We have done a lot of that work prior to COVID, going in and seeing, looking at the systems and change now, evaluating. That work was halted because of the pandemic, but we plan to continue that and we will get where you think, where you're saying we should be, and I agree with you, but we have to acknowledge we've come so far to have actually understanding. You know, when we first started this program, you remember we told you, we, we thought that we had, we said we had $1.9 billion in arrears. Where do you think that came from? How you think that was the how we found out that after a while things keep coming to the surface? We owe this body, we owe that body, we ain't pay this body, we ain't doing. Now we, I believe, in a position where we actually understand and know, and those are no longer happening. So we've come a long way. My other point I want to mention before I before I move on is ready to just think and just just there. I, I had a poke at you already this week on another matter, so it won't be strange me keep poking. We are all friends here. So you pointing the finger. Be nice, be nice. Hello, I gotta point the finger back at you. I see you and you have a role to play. I I, I think a lot of it, the, all the, the FM app is online. All the if, 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 um, fiscal framework that details the fiscal policy framework for knowing next two, three is online at, on cabinet's website. Everything I've mentioned is, is not in our box. It's there for the public to see. What happens that people don't know or have come across and not seen it, so they're not checking for it. The governor's report is there, and all the statistics are there. Ask anybody, there have been six IMF reviews so far, five is published online, plus the six one the concluding statement. How many people write those? I think I saw some one or two persons at UE having to speak about economic issues, trying to do their best to explain. But I think the university can, as it begged back in the 1991-92 economic program in IMF, they have, you, you guys have a duty to put on seminars, bring people together, not in any political partisan way, but to explain simply what is going on in the economy, where you can find data, how do you analyze and see what's happening, what's going on, put on a session on SOEs, right? And the performance of SOEs last versus now. I think the university really has an appointing figure, so allow me, 
drop the ball here in terms of educating the public. Now you mentioned Central Bank has been doing that, and I and with the, with the quarterly reports, yes. I know I saw they have something Central Bank 101, but exchange rates and things. UE, especially economics department, needs to step up. The information is out there. Yes, and you're correct. Yes, you're correct, Justin. In terms of we can do better in designing our websites, but we had a pandemic. We got a, I mean, we good, we will get there. But in terms of, and when you go to some ministries, you will see information is there, but people just don't know. So my point is, don't point your finger no more. Put a plan together with your university, your colleagues. You got good people out there yourself. Winston Moore is the, the the technical strong people and thing. And then we start having proper dialogue about developments and what's going on in interpretation of data. Um, someone asked me what they about something you said about the the, uh, the the current account deficit and they had to go through it again. Let's work that together. The data is the information there, but we all have a responsibility. In fact, I would say that responsibility that you have is your accountability paradigm. You, my friend, have to do your part. I have to do my part, and we all have to do your part. So let's work together. Justin, if you call me, we can help, I can help work out something where I can even take part in it. And, and put the information on there, people understand. On the issue of sanctions, we keep getting back to sanctions, sanctions. Look, I think what you, you, you don't just, you don't have a child, for example. You tell him, don't, don't do this. And you make you do it, you, you beat him or you chastise or you punish him because he are accustomed to it. Yeah, he's still getting accustomed to operating in a different environment. I don't think it, where, why the act allows for the director of the economy and finance to make a report, he can, on any SOE non performing, you can even move persons around. You can do a lot. But I believe because we have, we didn't get here yesterday, it took 15, 20, 10, 15 years to reach here. 10 years people haven't been reporting. People get accustomed to doing things a certain way, right? And in the pandemic, sometimes they revert. I think. Continue education, continue working with SOEs to strengthen their systems, continue the reform agenda we started with SOEs, continue working them to get accustomed to having systems that they don't have to reproduce every month, it automatically picks up by the third or fifth month the reports we need. And then MAU gets those reports, management content unit, and is able to analyze them very quickly. And we get a report of parliament. So we have to get that. So I don't think I want to focus yet on on consequences and chastising get the soes fixed as you're working on get them accustomed to reporting understanding the procedures and then if a if an officer or a particular area is still non-compliant then you'll be able to better deal with it and that's so i pause here for now trish thank you kevin all right on on the issue of transparency and accountability um you've thrown out a challenge to justin i'm justin i'm going to let you come back and respond but i want to give an example of that issue of, of transparency and how it links to accountability and to get uh, some commentary and it, it also links back to that issue of procurement kevin that you raised where you say we're going to be looking at having some new um procurement laws and rules um, because one of the things that we do very well is to pass the primary legislation and put a whole bucket list of things that can be put into regulations and regulations never see the light of day so i hope that that won't happen either with respect to the public finance act or to the procurement act or whatever has to be in the primary legislation goes into the primary legislation so that it can be effective but um, I'm, I'm not. No, I don't know if you're aware of a case that occurred in the UK earlier this year uh, related to procurement of PPE by the Secretary of State responsible for health and social care, and uh, an NGO called Good Law Project took the Secretary of State to court because the Sec Secretary of State essentially said um, we had to do the procurement. It was urgent, uh, I'm paraphrasing of course, and we didn't have time for all of that reporting, that's just paperwork. And in that case, the judge disagreed and uh, 
actually said the Secretary of State spent vast quantities of public money on pandemic related procurement during 2020 and the public was entitled to see who this money was going to and what it was being spent on and how the relevant contracts were awarded. And notwithstanding that we're looking at new legislation coming down the pipeline, we all still want to have right now at this moment access to that kind of information and I want each of you to comment on to, to give me your thoughts on how we perform in relation to that level of transparency and that level of transparency is obviously also tied to preventing corruption not saying that anybody's engaged in that but that is they're inextricably linked and so I'd like your comments on how we can improve transparency in the meantime and even when we pass legislation related to procurement how we can ensure that that transparency obtains and uh, that civil society have access to that information and information not just about procurement but other government activities and interactions because it's not just about who may have had a particular bid but it might be about who has influence and where we can have access to that kind of information so that civil society can play its role, the same kind of role, Kevin, well, sort of, the, the kind of role that you're saying the university would, would have to play. They have their own role. Civil society has its role. And so I'd like to have your comments on how we can do better, both in times of crisis and then beyond. And, and Kevin speaks a lot about how we change our systems, transform so that we can perform better as we come out of this crisis or as we may face others from time to time. So can I have your comments, Ed? <laughs> Transparency, okay. Well, I certainly think that in any private sector, you have an opportunity to, to communicate a lot more with your, with your client base or customer base. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about price gouging. Let's take, for example, the transparency of pricing. Um, we, we, we in the private sector haven't done a good job explaining to the public how the prices have been built up for, for certain items that we, we, we sell in the retail and disruptive sector. Um, one of the few items that we can explain is, is petrol, gasoline, and kerosene, and, and LPG. And that one single item that was so transparently put out there created an uproar I mean, just by putting one single item out there because it affects everybody in Barbados, basically, it created an uproar. And it still does, it still is creating an uproar about the, the level of taxation and why it isn't being reduced at a time like this, et cetera. But it is very difficult to, when you're in the retail and distributive sector, to explain every aspect of pricing and so on. I'm using pricing as, as a thing because it affects everybody in Barbados. And that's where you get a lot of comments about transparency. Uh, so it, 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 you have to be able to explain what are the core drivers of a pricing of your pricing policy. And that is something I think that, that companies and businesses have. We have not done a good job at that. And I'll be first to admit that I don't think we have done a good job at that. And showing the buildup of prices, what really caused it? What, what is the impact of, of inefficiency at the port of call or port of entry? in Barbados. Tremendous inefficiency we had previously was the impact of the demerge on, on containers due to that inefficiency, was the impact of the of the protocols and, and so on on the cost of, of storage and so on that we had to pay. A lot of these things drove up the prices and we, we needed to do a better, we should have done a better job publicizing this information and showing how it impacts prices in general. We were more reactive rather than proactive. And I think that's a lesson that we would have learned. You have to be, as a business person, you have to be more proactive in, in providing that level of transparency to how, what, what is happening, what is coming at us. I mean, we have tried that now with, with what's coming at us over the next few months in the, in the course of everything in Barbados. You still get a lot of negative feedback. But what's coming at us if we go there and continue to show the prices of containers coming from Far East, et cetera, and the prices of import prices, commodities going through the roof in the US, what is that doing to the cost of imports in Barbados? And, and that is important that we continue to do that, to, to warn people that these things are coming. And, and you know, that level of transparency has to be there. But you don't get you don't get all positive feedback. You got to be prepared to deal with the negative feedback through to transparency as well. 
The other thing in transparency I talk about from within the from your employees' point of view, employees have to be comfortable that what that what we are doing is fair above board. Everybody's being treated fair, fairly and equitably, and that is transparency in wh how we are operating as a as a as a company uh, in our our practices, whether it's procurement or whether it's human resource policies and practices. Um, that's why things like the whistleblower uh, mechanism, which I would like to see happen through through government legislation as well, the integrity legislation as well in government, that is something that we need to have passed as quickly as possible. But in companies, you have if you have a whistleblower policy where people can go in and co confidentially, anonymously, and 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 whistleblow basically, I think it allows uh, allows us to to see what's happening. You can't you can't be transparent. With, I mean, let's put, let's face facts. Everything is not transparent. Um, there are things of confidential nature you cannot just put out there in the, in the news. But you have to be seen to be acting fairly and equitably in whatever you do. Even when it comes to awarding of contracts in the private sector, and I'm sure in the public sector as well, there's nothing that says you have to accept the lowest bid. That does a given in, 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 in contract awarding. Um, you do not necessarily, sometimes it's the worst thing to accept the lowest bid because it's probably the worst bid. And I'm, I'm sure Justin and Kevin and many of us have experienced that uh, over the years. Uh, so you you have to be transparent in why why you didn't accept your lowest bid. And you have to be transparent in your policies and processes of, of procurement. And that, to me, that's the important thing. Your processes have to be very clearly stated. They have to be followed. And they have any exceptions to those policies have to be clearly stated and the reasons for doing so. Um, but I, I think in government say we, we, we have we have had issues around some things happening in government with the awarding of bids, the, the, the where there is no published information, um, the emergency situation with the procurement of vaccines that that came about after the fact, you know, but Everything is done for a reason, but if you are not upfront and, you, and things go bad, like what has happened with that vaccine acquisition, when things went wrong, there's a lot of egg on everybody's faces because it seems it seems as though it's perceived by the public that proper process, due process was not followed, the normal procurement process was not followed, and that's the same thing that can happen in any organization, government or private sector. And, and that's why I say that if you're not transparent and perceived to be transparent by those stakeholders involved, you have an issue. You have an issue and, and it is very hard to overcome that stigma. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Justin, can you offer your comment on the issue of transparency and how we achieve it, in particular to allow for involvement of civil society and and a lot of our a lot of the international agencies that we do business with are very much focused on that issue of civil society engagement transparency accountability etc and so it has you know a, a national import for us and uh, i'd like to have your comments on on that issue and I want to say that I, I agree with Kevin I think the university has a role to play and uh, I think there's a space that the university can fill and I would therefore like to have your comments specifically on the challenge that Kevin has thrown out to the University of the West Indies in education also operating as a non-governmental institution and in a business institution, although I think it's all of those <laughs> because it has its different roles that it plays. But I'd like to have your comment on how we can fill the gap in understanding uh, for the people who are the receivers of this information, sometimes misunderstanding the information, but also needing to have an opportunity to sort out the information for themselves so that they too can participate. Okay, uh, so, so so first of all, I think I want to echo a lot of what Ed said in terms of clear policies, clear procedures, in terms of modern thinking on transparency, the, the, the role of whistleblowers and whistleblower protection is seen as absolutely essential, you know, that persons who have access to that inside information should be able to whistleblow 
with protection. So I think that whistleblower element is extremely an extremely important piece of the puzzle. In terms of Barbados, the, the freedom, because I mean, a lot of stuff that you're speaking about that tends to happen in some other jurisdiction is driven by sort of Freedom of Information Act, where people can have access to that information. I think that's also a missing piece of our domestic puzzle in terms of that Freedom of Information Act, as well as the whistleblower protection. The role of the NGOs I find quite fascinating because I think that's one of the positive developments in Barbados. I think over the last decade, I think the challenges of the 2008-2018 period, I think, brought out a lot of NGOs. So I'm really quite pleased at the role that people like ICAB are playing. Certainly, when I first came to Barbados, you didn't get a lot of comment from ICAB around matters around the economy and so on. It was still very much an accountant club. I, I certainly see bodies like ICAB really stepping up. So I think that's been a very fun. You, you have the, the Economics Association. I think that that, that has become quite an, an important source of information. And even during this period of COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things I found interesting is maybe because we have the type of parliament we have, a lot of the government's debate has been with civil society bodies like, like BAM, the private sector body, the private sector association. I think these have been the players in many ways who have been debating with the government. And I see that as quite a positive development. And the Freedom of Information Act I think would be important in allowing those NGOs to play a role. I certainly would like to see an expansion in the role of those NGOs. I think one of the missing pieces, and Ed was talking about pricing and so on. I, I think a private sector association is only going to go so far in publishing that. I mean, a lot of that money you get into competitive information. They have. In, so a really strong consumer body, for example, I think is one of the missing elements in our civil society to really advocate for consumers, because sometimes that, 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 that can be quite missing. So I, I think we are on the right trajectory with the civil society bodies playing a much stronger role than I remember 10 or more years ago. I think their work would be greatly enabled if you had that whistleblower protection, as well as the freedom of information that they have access to, to that information. Now, in, in terms of the role of UWI, I certainly don't take it as a punch. I, I, I certainly am concerned to some extent, and, and it tends to vary in terms of the willingness of academics to engage the public. I mean, there is quite a lot of variability in that, you know, you have quite a number of good people and others, but people's willingness and comfort in the public space. So you have people like me who are always willing to open my mouth and say what I have to say. But, you know, we, we do have a number of colleagues who I think have a lot to add who are not as comfortable in the public space. But certainly within UWI, we do incentivize that in terms of academics. You know, the academics are assessed for their promotion and so on in terms you have four criteria your research is the most important your teaching your university service and your public service the public service is an explicit part of our assessment and persons are incentivized they, they choose to do that public service in in varying ways and that sort of engagement with the public the, the, the willingness of persons to engaging that i find varies Quite a lot. Sometimes we have a lot of people, other times we don't. It's really quite quite a mixed bag. There, there is no disincentive. But I also go back to my point I was making earlier, which I don't think in any way is really passing the buck, but the, the journalists are really the players that, that, that are experts in communicating with the public. And for me, it's somewhat disappointing that in the area of business economics that you have so much reporting on it. But when I look at those desks, Kevin, you know, 
I think those guys should be hiring a couple of good, uh, an econ, accounting, finance graduate, or don't have a couple of people there to really anchor those desks who can really interpret and filter that information in a manner for the general public. Because that, that is really their core constituency, the general public, in a way that it is not for many of our academics who can be quite uncomfortable in the public space. But there's clearly a critical role for UWI as a state-funded institution. And the state has committed to funding institutions during very difficult times to play that role in, in terms of public education. Thanks, Justin. Kevin, any comment from you on this issue of trans? Yes, please. Um, so first of all, Justin, put a structure in place and let people come. They would, don't leave it to their fantasies. And secondly, journalism is journalism. In my view, perhaps you should also form a partnership with some of them that you help. You know, when we were back many years ago, we had um, a school, we had a program where we would periodically meet with journalists and take them to economic analysis and things like that. Um, I don't necessarily agree that, I don't necessarily think they should hurry up. I, I just think if you want to help, let's form some partnership with some journalists. Uh, I know a few journalists who call me and they maybe explain one or two things and, and they then take it and know how to work with it. But that's, that's the reform. So you should put a structured program in place, Justin. Don't wait for people to do it. Um, on the issue of, um, and maybe you asked what we were doing, Trish, I don't, Trish, I don't want to give you the impression that government is waiting to do things because if I try to say things have been happening all along, okay? The tracking and reporting on crisis expenditures already took place, have been has consistently taking place, and there's a budget line. Supplementaries, when they go to cabinet for approval, there's a budget line where you can see what each item is for. Um, the reporting, the cap parliament on all COVID related procurements in excess of a million dollars have already started and is consistent. The beneficial ownership information that database is up and running and available now for the corporate registry. And so those are things already happening to improve transparency. And the audit by the accounting general, auditor general, sorry is ongoing and then we expect to have that by the end of this um december so we so even though the new procurement law will come into place we are not waiting briefly for that all right so i, I wanted right, to give yeah. i didn't want to convey the impression of, of of that sort of thing i'll two other things i should mention because we talked about this uh, i don't know if course is aware that um Government laid two pieces of legislation in Parliament, both in September. One was a prevention of corruption bill to provide the prevention, investigation, and the prosecution of acts of corruption. That was passed in both the houses in Parliament in October. And then there was the deferred prosecution bill to empower the director of public prosecutions to meet and, uh, and be able to construct agreements concerning criminal liability. And cabinet have also approved a whistleblower protection bill in October. That will be laid, expect to be laid in November. So Trish, I, I, Trish, I want to, I want, I, don't, I want to leave with the point that things are happening. You're not waiting for something to happen later. While, while the procurement act and the integrity and public, like all those things are bills, things are happening along the way to make them work. Okay. All right. So, so, so let me any, any let me day, comment on that. They are further than we were before. Uh, in terms of agreed, uh, absolutely. Nobody. Now, on the issue of the UBO register, I interface with Kaipo regularly. I'm going to have to go look for it. I can't tell you that I don't. I know that it's not there. I know when I look what I see. <laughs> I know I can hardly see anything. But I will do a diligent search and then I'm going to come to you directly, Kevin, to report on whether that register is up and available for the rest to see. But what I can say is this. What I can see as an agent of Kaipo, most Barbadians cannot see. And so we're talking about all Barbadians being able to see it and not having to have a special registration process not having to have a special designation to be able to have access and and frankly not having not having to go into Kaipo because we want to minimize traffic into these uh, entities but they should be able to see it and so that's the level of accessibility that 
I'd like to see, and that I think would be the, the, the voters and taxpayers and residents of Barbados are entitled to. So that's on that particular issue. And uh, on the issue of what's currently going on, um, yes, we, we have to accept that there has been a lot going on. A lot has been going on during this crisis uh, related to dealing with uh, combating corruption and so on. And uh, we obviously all look forward to new legislation being put on the books to cover the whole slate of potential uh, corrupt ad activity or maladministration, etc. We have a question. We have quite a few questions, actually. So I'm going to go to some of the questions. And let's start with this one. Mr. Greenwich, isn't the education of the consequence or sanction part of the process. I don't think you can cherry pick any part of the accountability or accountability structure or standards. So I think that person is, is saying to you uh, in response to your um, explanation that we're looking at education and, and having people change their culture at the moment, that uh, education to us and to them of the consequences is something that has to be occurring at this point in time. So can you comment on that question? Well, we are entitled to our opinions. Actually, Kevin, before you answer, I think there's a part two to that question. So I'm going to give you that part two. And that part two is, uh, I also think that it's a responsibility of government to disseminate its info in a manner that is understandable to the electorate. It must not be left to another organization. So that obviously also relates to your invitation to Justin to have um, the university more active in in educating the public. comments. Please. I missed that with really the second one first. <clears throat> There's a standard way in which one publishes information. Um, and this is guided by international standards, and the, and the government does it according to that. When I talk about other institutions right now, you can publish all the data you want <clears throat> on the performance the economy, et cetera. But unless some person is trained to interpret that data in terms of what it means, the interlinkages, you know, talking about the economy collapsing I see by 18%, and then I'm Justin Robinson, Justin here, talk about the, the balance of payments. So then I had I came and talked about the linkage between the collapse and the balance of payments and showing why it matters. There's room for that sort of education level for the public, irrespective of all the form of which the information is put out. Because I could put out information on GDP and the performance of different sectors and all that, but putting together is not an easy task. You have to be trained to do that. We have a high level, highly educated population. And so it shouldn't be too difficult to leverage that level of education to help everybody inform. I believe when people are better informed, they're able to be make better economic choices and decisions. So I think they will for that. On the first part of the question about um, sanctions and how to approach SOEs and things, I mean, I think there should be, the act allows for dealing us dealing with institutions who are not reporting foreign standards etc do you get the base state do you guide them i think that's a matter of opinion i may have my views as i advise the government but government officials and ministers may have another view so i understand what the person is saying and I'm, I'm, it's fine at the end of the day we're working towards the same goal though which okay. is to improve the, the 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 reporting standards in the soes to ensure that the service delivery is up to the quality and that they are not that they are fit for purpose and do not become a drain on the government for a string for a string on our taxpayers. So Kevin, I think I think that what we would be having as a response from members of the audience is that we all know we have a lot of laws. That's the first part. We recently I, I had the consolidated index looking at it, and one of my youngsters said, What is this? And I said, uh, so a list of all of our laws. And I said, All of our laws. <laughs> so that we have so many laws. And I said, Yes. So imagine my life trying to read through them. But we have a lot of laws. But in the main, they have some penalty section to it and the penalty sections quite often impose penalties on private sector entities and government entities what 
we find is that there's a lot of complaint that there is not enforcement. So I think what you're getting from the members of the audience is that training, um, a chance to come up to speed, all of that, we want to get to a stage where we're not just reading, let's say, the Auditor General's report or looking at the PAC um, activities in Parliament, etc., but that we see that there is accountability by enforcement. And I think that's the the commentary that the audience are asking from you. I, it, it may not be fair because you are not the person who we have put to ensure that these laws are um, adhered to, but you might be able to offer some insight as to the extent to which we can see that we lean more towards enforcement and therefore um, achieve a higher level of accountability. That's a question. Right. So, again, I, I would say from my personal view point that I think it's better to incentivize people to comply and train them. I think people naturally, I don't think um, CEOs or, or it says political SOEs, I don't think the, the SOEs leadership, the management, and the, um, the CFOs want not to comply. Okay. I think in most, almost all the instances when I when it happened and we call, is either a, there's an issue we have inherited old systems, for example, right? COVID came along. There are different reasons. And so, starting from a premise that people would want to complain if you make it easy and incentivize them, I personally, this is my personal view now, not government view, is that we should take the route of training, incentivizing, and helping persons and putting systems that they can comply. Because I believe everybody go to work and want to do this. I suppose, so coming down with the base state should be the last thing in my view. I don't necessarily agree that that's the rule. But like I said, that's my opinion, and that person must have a different one. The important thing is that the law, the 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 the, the acts, for example, PFM, et cetera, allows for taking on ways to enforce complex. The degree in which it is depends. I have a my view how that should be should be done. So, I, in in that regard, I think there is a I don't want to say hunger, but Barbadians, because they they feel that at the public sector level because we're not just talking about SOEs we're talking about central government as well and and the rules apply to all public officers and in some degree it applies to private sector entities or people who are dealing with government entities or departments and so the the director of finance has very strong powers to deal with actors across the spectrum really and obviously those powers the powers of government to deal with the private sector will be expanded, have been expanded in the anti-corruption legislation, but also will be expanded in any additional legislation that they put in place. But I think that what we're looking at is um, an expectation that in order to ensure that all of the government actors are accountable, but not just accountable, that they meet the standard of performance from a, a finance management perspective, they themselves have to see that sanctions are enacted and, and enforced. Now, I will say that I have seen where there is disciplinary action taken against public servants. So that happens. That's not something that's new. And it's not something that doesn't happen. So it, it, it does happen and they're, they're functionaries of government that have the responsibility, I shouldn't say functionaries, there are functions that have the responsibility of dealing with disciplinary matters. Um, so I do agree with you that it isn't necessarily that that's where you start. And yes, there are those powers in place and strengthened in the Public Finance Management Act. But I think we also have to look at the message that it sends then. I think that's really what we're looking at. Um, whether people get the sense that government is seriously enforcing its own rules and uh, not necessarily having those that enforcement as a last resort but having it as a resort depending on the seriousness of the infelicity inaction negligence whatever it might be you're that you're trying to contend with and that, that's just my own comment on that issue and i have been at pains to read that legislation so that i too understand how it applies across mm -hmm. SOEs 
and not just that but for private entities who are interacting with government so um i i understand just make one point on that where i agree with you i'm not talking about don't write criminal behavior and that sort of thing i'm talking about we're talking about um prudent financial performance and reporting etc um, you remember, I mean, let's keep perspective. We, since my, since I came on board as an advisor, what I've noticed is that because of the, a lot of skilled persons, et cetera, had exited public service way before the board program came. And so a lot of persons that remain sometimes were not in a position or had the necessary tools and equipment and skills to do certain things. So when you come and say you have to do this by a certain time, it takes time, it takes training. We are trying to rebuild the public sector in terms of skills and competencies, right? And so therefore, most of the time, almost 90%, 100% of the time, when an institution makes a deadline, or when something wasn't done, it's a quick procedure. It's not malicious intent, I find. I find it simply because a system error or a person didn't understand it or something, and this is really, in my view, training. It's much more effective investing in systems, retooling, restructuring, redigitizing the system from paper to day. It's much more effective in getting confidence and keeping confidence than the base state approach. But that's my view. So you have come back around to what Ed first started talking about, which is continuity planning. And obviously that is necessary in government institutions as well and in central government so that the people who have to confront a crisis have the tools that are necessary to confront that crisis. And that just, that's not just the people that we see every day, those who are in cabinet or, or on um, project teams or what have you, but those people who are behind the scenes who have obviously still have to ensure that rules are complied with and, and you know, things keep taking over and that our assets, yes, us, <laughs> and y'all, because we all are taxpayers and voters and residents and all of that, that our assets are protected, safeguarded um, at a time when systems may have to be set aside. Uh, let, let's go to some of the other questions. Um, why not just agree on a set of indicators and use them? The IMF Monitoring Committee, does it publish the economic indicators they are tracking? I haven't seen anything. Kevin, that's an appropriate question for you. Uh, I don't, well, again, all the indicators um, we've done I mean, uh, today, over 30 structural reforms, all the indicators in those structural reforms are published every review on the MF website. But more importantly, Ed here, Mr. Clark, was co-chair up to very recently of the BERT, that's Babis Recovery and Transfer Monitoring Committee. And Ed produces a report, I think it's once a quarter, which includes those exact information, and he has a press conference, and he makes that information available. So it's not only available on government website, it's not only available on the MF website and the MF report, but we have our independent monitoring committee, which is a subcommittee of the social partnership that publishes that information on a regular basis. So the, 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 the person posing the question, um, it is there, it is made public, and I encourage you to go and have a look at it over time. And that's available on the government's website, or is there a local, uh, sorry, not government, the IMF's website, or is there a local a government website that, you know, Is it available on the IMF website? Uh, the Burt Morning Committee published a report every quarter. I'm not sure if that is available on a website, but the IMF reports, um, I cannot say that we've republished them, but I can look into that. But definitely they're on the IMF website. They're likely to be on the Central Bank website, a link to it, and I believe Ed will publish it already also. But the key point is that the information is there. Yeah, we just need to let people know where to find it, and how to assess it. All right, Justin, here's, here's one for you. How satisfied, well, it says is the UE, but I'm going to ask you, how satisfied are you that the UE's offerings were tested by this crisis and passed, and that UE passed, you know, any any test that it, that it encountered during this crisis. What adjustments, if any, are there are they making to their programs to better prepare future leaders? And and it's specifically to contend with 
times of crisis. Okay, so certainly the, the pandemic has been a major test for educational institutions. I think we would have passed the test in terms of transitioning to what we call emergency remote teaching, delivering the classes online. I, I think that went reasonably well. And in terms of the latter part of the question about changes to the programs, one of the things we became a lot more conscious with from COVID was that, you know, you have, you have a lot of people, young people are on computers or they're on cell phones a lot and so on, but some of their digital and IT skills are not where you would expect it to be, given that you always see people on smartphones and so on. And we certainly, as we were making that transition, we had to invest then, and we are continuing to invest in really getting a larger percentage of students than we expected to have a level of competence in that digital space. So that, that has been one of the adjustments that we have had to engage in. In many ways, the biggest test was how we test. Because, you know, we had really gotten a lot. I mean, we had the traditional, you come into a room, you are locked away for two, three hours, exams are proctored, and so on. And moving to testing in the online environment has certainly been an, an, an ongoing challenge that, that we, are, we, are, we are evolving with. So, for example, you know, if you have a traditional two hour exam and you can set it up online now. I think we've done a lot of that training. You have software like Respondus, which can lock down browsers and monitor cheating and so on. But then you have people who, depending on where they live or whatever, you know, the, their internet slows down during the exam. Can, can you really hold them to a uh, <laughs> a two hour exam, you know, so there's a sort of ongoing, like what is the window for allowing to up? So, so I think that is something we are really evolving in that we, I think we have the technological side right, but there is more of a digital divide in Barbados than we sometimes think in terms of the access, but I think that is ongoing. In terms of program development, I guess that's an interesting question because a lot of the program changes at UWI are really being led by another Greenwich in terms of digital transformation, the use of big data, and so on. Those have been some of the major programming changes led by the other Greenwich, who I shall not give his first name, but Kevin knows him very well, that he's really been on the forefront of that. And the other aspect really relates a little bit to that some of that debate you know the big stake how you approach it is really that that whole behavioral side i mean how do people really behave <laughs> how do people make decisions you know we we've had so you know very early in the pandemic one of my marketing colleagues sent me a graph about a, what they call a product adoption curve you know the rate at which consumers adapted new products and the COVID-19 vaccines adaptation has almost followed that chart to a T. <laughs> you know, you have the early adopters, you have a group in the middle, and then you're almost now getting into that hard course. So, 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 so that behavioral aspect, you know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of our programming has been kind of strong technically. But, but in terms of how people actually make decisions, how do real human beings make decisions when they are out there? And that be infusing those insights from psychology and, and behavioralism across aspects of our curriculum has been something that has really come to the fore. But I hope I've answered that question. We've had to not so much adjust the programs, but we've had to invest quite a bit in getting a larger percentage of our population than, uh, than we thought, really digitally comfortable because they're learning in that digital space. And really the use of big data, getting that across more of our disciplines, digital transformation 
and, and the insights in terms of behavioralism. Those have been some of the major changes that, that we are seeing now. All right, Ed and, and uh, Kevin, this is quite an interesting question, a simple question. What, given what has been said by Dr. Greenwich, has government considered con succession planning? Um, and I, I'm going to assume that is something that the social partnership would have looked at. And uh, Kevin, obviously, again, in looking at the strategic planning for government, I'm going to assume that it's been looked at, but I'm going to ask you to comment on that question, or well, not comment on the question, answer that question. Ed. Okay, you're talking from a government perspective or a private sector perspective? So the, the question specifically is about succession planning in government. So I'm 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 pointing it to you because I'm going to assume that social partnership has looked at that. Well, no, no. To be honest, social partnerships does very little about uh, human side of, of of succession planning for government. Or I mean, when it comes to the to the members of the social partnership, certainly like the private sector association, we do have a process of of changing out officers and so on and our representatives will change um, and the unions will probably have the same thing but on the side of government is pretty much ministerial um, attendance and, and some other officers like Kevin and, and Mr. Car Ian Carrington and, and those um, senior officials but really and truly we don't get into any succession planning that that you know and it is it is good that you asked that question was asked because it is something I go back to do about culture um, you know, I think Justin did mention a bit about it earlier. Okay, Kevin, I, I will praise him. You don't mind he's present here, you know, but Kevin has done a fantastic job in his role with the government of Barbados and bring about a sense of professionalism and, and, and reporting and, and standards that are expected because of his experience and has been able to do that and hold people accountable. And, and you know, he is not political, and but he has certainly been able to pass on that knowledge and, and standard of expectation to the people reporting to him and around him. Now, what happens when Kevin goes? Because I, I don't know Kevin's future uh, when we talk about succession planning. What happens when the IMF goes? Are, are we going to see a fallback approach to what has been in prior years? God help us if we do. We would hope that is not the case. And I, I want to to see the succession planning for Kevin's, um, who he is mentoring now, and who other people are mentoring now, that they will come with the professionalism and responsibility and, be, and, and keep people accountable for what is required to continue the good work that has been started in the last three years of improvement. And I do agree with Kevin, a lot of improvement has taken place in the SOEs. I mean, it's like night and day, but there's still, you know, there's certain aspects of night what already night we are, um, but certainly and truly there's still a long way to go. But a lot has been done to improve the, the quality of reporting and the management information and so on. And I've seen it since I've been on BERT, when I was on BERT initially until when I left recently, uh, the, the monitoring committee. So we need to ensure that the succession planning and the right people are appointed that have the leadership qualities and the skill sets in all aspects of government. That happens in the private sector. We do that now in all of our companies, and that is that is done con continuously. Uh, succession planning for key roles in, in organizations. And government, I, I'm sure the, the human resource side of government is doing that. But there are critical positions in certain many of these SOEs, especially in other ministries. And Kevin hit the nail on the head earlier. A lot of very good and experienced, skilled people left the civil service um, over the last 10 years earlier than some of them should have. A lot, there were, there were gaps in knowledge and so on that had to be filled pretty quickly and people had to fill some big boots without the skill set and experience. And, and a lot of mentoring and guiding has had to take place in the last few years. But we have to ensure that that doesn't happen again, that there's true succession planning and training and mentoring going on so that these standards and the professionalism that we want continue into the future. Kevin. <clears throat> um, Chris, I, um, from, from the perspective of, of what you said about mm -hmm. the strategic planning. I'm sorry? You had earlier mentioned that you, the government is doing its planning, so forward looking. And so um, I wanted to contextualize the question uh, from that perspective. 
is there succession planning that is ongoing or will that form part of your strategic planning? So <clears throat> I do know that government is involved and is working on succession um, planning. I unfortunately have not been involved in it in that, inside the human resource side of it. So I really can't speak with any authority for what is happening. To do so probably would mislead people as persons. Um, but I agree that it's key, is important, and it is so, it's very important so that we don't uh, return to where we were before, as I just pointed out, which is why I'm, and my position is that we, we need to continue training. In fact, prior to COVID, you would remember Prime Minister talk about a national training program, right? Mm -hmm. Where we have to not only train in government, but all across a national training program. And we were set, we have set aside funds to do that. That is part of the process, I think, going on. But specific to succession planning, I, I'm really not in a position to speak about it because I don't know enough information. Right, thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to take one more question. We've run a little bit over eight and we're going to go for another 10 or so minutes and uh, then we'll have to wrap up. We have obviously an excellent conversation going on and lots of interest from the audience. And just so let me just punt this last question to all of you. I have not heard the panelists speak to the issue of how we address accountability as it relates to corporate and public climate responsibility. That's obviously a very topical issue. So I'll ask each of you to offer a comment uh, or an answer in, in relation to that question. Justin? Okay, so certainly in many ways, what would be the, the issue of the day? So on the accounting side, I know there's been quite a lot of progress. I mean, I, I recently took part in a, in a workshop Standard and Poor's in terms of ES and G reporting, ESG reporting, you know, environmental sustainability and governance reporting. So I, I would certainly like to see ICAB in particular play a strong role in, in sort of promoting many more of our organizations engaging in ES and G reporting. I know some of the bigger ones like maybe Sajiko and others that play more in an international space do it. I don't see a lot of that necessarily in our local space. And I always think, you know, when we confront these issues, we always have to be careful that we focus on the aspects that maybe affect us most. So when I look at this globally, there's a lot of emphasis around emissions and pollution. I think in our case, that is not so much the issue. So in terms of any locals, any, any tweaking of standards and reported locally, I would like to see more focus on, on resilience, sustainability and adaptation. Because in, in many ways that that is our challenge in terms of the climate crisis. I don't think in Barbados we can, with our best effort, we can pollute enough to affect the global climate, but we are on the receiving end of the fallout. So in terms of our adaptation, our adoption of any ESNG type reporting, I would like to see a strong emphasis on resilience, adaptation, sustainability, because that is really our challenge in the in terms of the climate crisis. And an organization like ICAP does have a strong role to push that ESG reporting in our context. Ed? Ed, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I do agree with Justin. I think that we, we, we can push the reporting a lot more. Having said that, I think that a lot is being done currently by the private sector to, to ensure that we protect the environment a lot more than was done in the past, whether it is something as simple as LED bulbs, LED lighting, um, you know, much more recycling being done, the, the photovoltaic um, electricity supply, wind turbines, and some of them small small set but a lot is being done to ensure that the environment is being protected some people have changed their company vehicles to electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles so there are a lot of things being done to protect the environment but we're not reporting um structurally on them so that is something that we can do better um obviously some companies are, are stronger in that than other companies and a lot of the international companies as well have a lot more um 
requirements in that regard to report out these things and the, how they're protecting the environment and, and the spend that they're, they're spending on these various issues. But I, I do believe we can do better reporting, but I do see a change in, in attitudes by a lot of companies and how they go about the actual management of how they operate within an environment. And I think it is improving and I would like to see a lot more done. Obviously in Barbados, we would like to see a lot more recycling. Um, recycling, I think, will help a lot in that regard. We still have way too much littering in Barbados and, and we need to ensure that, that people are educated better as well. And that, that is something that we as, as, as a, a private sector can do more about that. We can actually help to educate the, 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 the wider public to protect the environment. And so, you know, things like that, waste, energy wastage, um, energy consumption, those are the areas where we, we impact the, the, the environment. Obviously, the, the coastline, the coastal um, and degradation and so on that we are seeing happening around Barbados now, um, you know, we have to educate what is causing it, what are we doing to cause these things to happen, what do we have control over. So th those are things that I would like to see more done uh, from the private sector that we can report out to the public, uh, educate the public more, but report out what we are doing as our own individual entities to help protect the environment as well. We are not there yet, Tricia, yeah. but we, we, we certainly mm -hmm. need to get there. Thanks. Kevin, your comments on um, climate responsibility. Um, I would, uh, first of all, I endorse everything I said, just on that front. For me, is everybody's, each and every one of us, be agents, citizens, residents of Barbados, responsibility, accountability as it relates to climate change. Um, you have seen our Prime Minister and other officials in Glasgow at COP26 trying to argue for many, many, in many, on many fronts, um, provision for financing for the issues that we have not caused, um, for provision of inclusion of how we get access to financing. Argue and advocate for the need to reduce emissions to 1.5, temperatures to 1.5, different things. So that's happening at that level. And then I talk about the, the responsibility of companies, et cetera, in terms of greening and moving to non-fossil fluid and, and um, deep solar panels, et cetera, et cetera, alternative. But even at the individual level, he talked about recycling and, 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 and he's asked some of the ways. I think we have to focus too on adaptation individually. For example, you, I mean, I use solid two hour also presentation Prime Minister give actually from Glasgow to media. And she stressed things like, we have to move on from our reliance on fossil fuel, even as a household individual. So simple things like chasing or LED bulbs, looking to replace appliances with more efficient ones. Yes, carpooling. We have cases where in Barbados also some also have three and four cars and they're going to the city all together at the same time. All right. Why? Why? Write a bit more. So individually, I think each of us individually have to make decisions. Yes, we are not the ones causing it, but that's beyond us. We have to live with what we have. But make individual decisions to reduce and adapt to what we have. I talk about them, but I would just say if we've done what I said, even at the individual person's level. What can you do? So instead of, um, I mean, we could perhaps even go back to the yesteryear, I remember the old time days, when you filed that for uh, like, a really car, and you saw another person say, you want to drop down? <laughs> I don't know that we feel comfortable about it's doing that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not, hold on, hold on, hold on. Of course, wear really your mask and all that, yes. <laughs> I quote, I heard all COVID rules and regulations. Uh, but the okay, point is, if I do do it, I might do it with a student from time to time when they were at school. In exactly. Particular. So and I sit is, in the back and you have the windows open and exactly. keep your mask So on. the point is, instead of three and four cars leaving a house to the town or neighborhood, so you got to do, you got to go town tomorrow, pay a bill, I going tomorrow too. So let me, let me go down together. And different things like that, which would, um, and you don't have to wait for government regulation, do this carpooling, um, and things can happen and, and to reduce our footprint. Okay. Um, you don't have to wait for regulations. I know, for example, in the United States, 
um, like this part there in terms of working. They got certain highways you can't go on unless you have three or four people in your car. And if you go on it, it's a heavy feed. You get hit really hard. We don't need to take that because we can do, we have small streets, but we can do what we need, even in terms of our building codes and how we build our houses, the, the, the structural rules by means when talking about different things. My point is individually, it is that each and every one of us that they account uh, the responsibility and be accountable for what we do as it relates to this issue of climate change. Thanks, Kevin. Well, we, we have come to the end. I, I wanted to put on the table um, some of the points, the, the principles that have been established by the UN Global Compact, and that's a voluntary initiative uh, based on CEO commitments uh, to implement the sustainability principles. And, and Justin referenced the uh, sustainability goals. And in particular, so we, we've talked a lot about, about government uh, for obvious reasons, and we've been able to talk somewhat about the activities of businesses. But I think I'd like to leave with talking about some education, uh, leave the the audience with an idea of some of these principles uh, as they relate to accountability and uh, those principles are based on there's four tenets and those tenets are human rights labor environment and anti-corruption and i think what would be applicable to us whether in a crisis or uh, on an ongoing basis would be, for example, that businesses should support and respect the protection of internationally proclaimed rights, make sure that they are not complicit in any rights abuses, that businesses should uphold the freedom of association and effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining, uh, the elimination of all forms of forced or compulsory labor, effective abolition of child labor, and the um, elimination of discrimination in respect of environment and sorry employment and occupation on the environmental front that their uh, businesses should support precautionary approaches to environmental challenges so as we've all discussed here getting ahead of the issue uh, undertaking initiatives to promote greater environmental responsibility and encouraging the development and diffusion of environmentally friendly technologies and then finally that businesses should work against corruption in all its forms including extortion and bribery and all of these principles obviously are principles that would be applicable to the functioning of government gentlemen I'm going to ask you to just give your final thoughts on uh, how we are performing and, and what we can do kind of the way forward, less so how we are performing, I think we've covered that, the way forward, um, what we think we can do to ensure that we reach and maintain the highest levels of accountability both in businesses and in the government activities. Ed. I think certainly in the businesses, we continue to build on our governance models. And certainly, I think most businesses hold most of their staff accountable at this stage. Um, management is held accountable by their boards. I'd like to see more of that. Um, you have to be very clear in your, in your goals and what is expected of you and what you expect of people. Transparency, honesty, and high integrity. And that's what I see in business. And I, I see it the same in, in government. You have to have strong leadership. You have to have a culture, an underlying culture, that these things are not tolerated and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable behavior. And we have to see people being held accountable for what they're re responsible for. I want to see that going forward. True accountability of your responsibility. There's no longer passing the butt and waiting until a new minister or whoever else comes on the next time around. We have to hold our employees, public employees, accountable for their actions and our public boards accountable for their actions. And of course, our leaders. Um, yeah. If I can well, put some I words in your mouth. We have a chance to do that every five years. So. Well, that, well, and it's arguable whether, that, whether that's enough. Uh, Kevin, your comments, your final comment. Uh, my final comments. Um, I would say I think we have come a really long way on the board program in terms of increasing accountability and transparency within government. Um, and the, by the end of this year, you will see even further changes. 
I think what we have to focus on going forward you know, is training. A lot has to do with training persons and understanding the new rules and uh, how, to, how to improve and use the systems in an efficient and effective manner. The reporting systems, et cetera, to bring great efficiency. We will get back to that once we get off this COVID environment and we're able now to refocus attentions and reject on that. To me, the future is bright. We're heading there, but um, Rome wasn't built in a day. And we didn't arrive here in one day either, but we've made a lot of progress. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Justin, your final comments. Okay, thanks. And I start by, I think, persons in public life. I think one of the things we must accept, and the pandemic has made it crystal clear, is that there is a massive trust deficit in our societies. You know, they did the trust in public institutions, public officials, even the private sector. That trust is really low. And I, I, I think that's a reality that we must begin from. And in light of that massive trust deficit, institutions need to invest quite heavily in demonstrating accountability to their various stakeholders. You're not entering a relationship with trust. You know, pe people are really quite skeptical about this. So I think organizations, institutions need to invest in having a few simple, clear benchmarks, performance measures that, that are published, that are out there, that, that are measured, and that they demonstrate that employees' leadership are held accountable. So if you think of SSA, citation, you know, percentage of garbage collected. You know, you, you have a service standard, you know, the, you will have a garbage collection at least once a week. You know, that, that's a clear service standard, a clear benchmark that it's measured, it's published, and that there are consequences, positive and negative, when these standards are not met. Because if we don't have these clear benchmarks with accountability for meeting or not meeting them, that trust deficit is not going to go and it's going to get worse. And when we have crises like COVID and other things that will come, when you have that lack of trust, it just makes a difficult situation much more difficult to manage. So I see the accountability challenge as really an essential one if you are to rebuild that trust in public officials and public institutions that are, that are necessary if complex modern societies are to function well. Thank you very much, Justin. Gentlemen, audience, we have come to the end of our program. I think we could talk for a couple more hours if they let us, um, but I don't think I can't believe us. I don't think our families will let us. And, you know, for those of us who may have meetings or business or other publics won't let us. Thank you so much, Justin, Kevin, Ed, for participating in this. And thank you so much to the audience. Thank you to the team in the background that have been feeding those questions and letting us know that they're there. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think we probably could host a part two and explore some more issues in depth. But thank you again, and thank you to the audience. Thank you to ICAB and its team for hosting this event, and it is timely and uh, topical. And so congratulations to you, and I wish you the best on behalf of the panelists for the rest of your week of activities. Thank you so much, and to the audience, I wish you good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.